that Priyanka Navani can bring us up to date from the Lebanese capital. Priyanka. Absolutely. You know, Aaron, we've spoke at length about what this war between Israel and Hezbollah means on the international and regional level. But I want to dive a little bit further into what this means for Lebanon domestically. I'm now joined by Professor Makram Raba. He is a professor at the American University of Beirut. He's a dear friend of mine and indeed someone you definitely do not want to be getting into a political debate with. Thank you so much Thank for joining me today. You just came from teaching. Can I just start by asking you how your students are seeing what is happening right now? Well, basically, my students, just like the rest of uh, their generation, are very resilient and very brave. But at the sa same time, they're going through hell in more than one way. Their country is being destroyed. The entire region is being destroyed. And they don't have access to proper education. Whereas we are teaching online, this is not the teaching that they deserve, basically. You have said before that one of the risks of this war is that voices of opposition will slowly fall into the abyss. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, there's a number of reasons why I said this. One, that many people believe that in the face of war there should be unity, and the priority is not to point out at the mishaps of whatever Hezbollah or the political establishment is doing. This is basically the biggest fault. Not to mention that now Hezbollah are like a cornered cat which means they'll become more aggressive. In peacetime, they killed my friend Luqman Salim, and they will try to bully me and threaten me a number of times. So I believe that with time, they'll become more and more aggressive because simply they are blaming local voices of opposition for what's happening with them in their confrontation with Israel, which is totally unfounded. We live in a divided political reality, not just amongst voices of opposition like yourselves and Hezbollah, but even within the opposition itself. Do you think the opposition, or really the entire country at large, is going to be able to take advantage of a weakened Hezbollah and reform the country in the ways that they have long wanted to? Well, anyone who is interested in surviving uh, this war needs to understand that there's only one way forward, basically electing a good president, one that can actually negotiate on our behalf, immediate ceasefire because this bloodshed even to the people fighting with Hezbollah is unacceptable and more important which is very very urgent is getting the displaced back to their homes which will require years of reconstruction so I believe that we don't have the luxury of fighting what the form of government will be we need to bring back the head of the state which is the president and then slowly but surely moves to move move towards de-escalation and the total end of this so-called uh, devastating war you are, I think I would say, one of the most outspoken critics of Hezbollah in Lebanon. Do you think that people will turn away from them if a new political reality is not presented to them, particularly when Hezbollah is not just a resistance force, but for many people in the Shia community, they are a voice for them. They are their representation. I have said this many times. Maybe one of the most dangerous things in Hezbollah's arsenal are their weapons. The, the real threat that Hezbollah poses, it actually gives the impression that can actually play a sectarian role by protecting the Shiites, which obviously it failed in doing. I believe the reason why Hezbollah exists is because we didn't have a Lebanese state to defend the people of the south and to defend our border. So the only way forward other than disarming Hezbollah is disarming the idea of Hezbollah. When you have a strong state, a state that can project authority and confidence to the people living in the south, then we no longer need Hezbollah. I'm not only an outspoken critic of Hezbollah, I'm also a very outspoken critic to the lack of government and the lack of responsibility, which the entire political establishment doesn't really stand up and take lead of what should be done. Let's talk about that a little bit more. Outside of the politics, we know that there are 1.2 million people in Lebanon that are displaced across 900 shelters. Those shelters are not enough. The needs are going to be great for months, if not years, to come. Are we going to see money trickling in, or has the government squandered those possibilities because of what many people have called negligence and mismanagement? Well, to anyone hearing this, I expect that the international community should not give money to the government except if the government reforms. We have done this before. Qatar, Turkey, the entire world has given money to Lebanon and to Hezbollah and we saw how the money went into turning Dahye into an arms depot. 
money should be given to the people of Lebanon through proper governance and proper oversight. So it's not really a matter of if we're going to re reconstruct or not. We should do it right. We've done this many, many times ago. I think thir third time should be the charm. We don't want a fourth Lebanon war, a fifth Lebanon war. And it's no longer a matter if the international community wants to help us. It has become apparent that the Lebanese people need to have help themselves before the international community can come and help us. Thank you so much, Doctor. I really appreciate it. That is Dr. Makram Rabah speaking to us about what this moment, what this war means for Lebanon, not just on an international level, but here on a domestic level where many people within the opposition are hoping to take advantage of this moment, take advantage of a weakened Hezbollah and reform the country to a place that it thinks it has long, it should have long been in. Uh, Priyanka,